Welcome to Love and Murder. I'm your host, Kai. In today's episode, we take the term, these shoes are made for walking, to a whole other level. What would you do if you only wanted to be married for money? It's the tale of the brown shoe bandit. Let's talk about it. It's Love and Murder. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of Love and Murder. Today, it's just me. It's just me, your good old neighborhood Kai, all by herself, bringing you this show. First, I want to start off by saying sorry we missed last week, but a lot of stuff going on here, a lot of changes going on with the with the podcast and everything, so we didn't get to last week's show. But I'm here today. Today we're back. So let me go ahead and introduce myself. For everybody who doesn't know, hi, my name is Kai. This is Love and Murder, a show where we talk about true crime cases dealing with relationships that have gone terribly wrong. And when I say terribly wrong, what I really mean is dead wrong, six feet under wrong. So this is the kind of cases we bring you. So if you haven't listened to us before and you know, you're listening to us on Stitcher or whatever, but you'd like to get your podcasts anywhere, you can definitely catch us on Apple Podcasts. You can catch us on uh, Spreaker. You can catch us wherever you like to listen to your podcast. So you can find where we are on our website at www.murderandlove.com. That's basically love and murder backwards. www.murderandlove.com. And right there on the homepage, it shows you everywhere we are. You can just click on it and go to where you like to listen to your podcast. Go ahead and follow us on social media. The links are below. I'm not going to take up the beginning of the, of the show with giving you those links. But the links are in the show notes below, but definitely go ahead and follow us. And if you want bonus episodes of the craziest true crime stories or relationship questions and answers or just relationship stories, then you can visit us on patreon.com forward slash love and murder and become a subscriber of $3 and above. If you've listened to our, th- our show before, and you like it, then please go to Apple Podcasts and hit that purple button and give us five stars. One, two, three, four, five. And say whatever you want in the description. It definitely helps bring us up in the charts so other people could easily find our podcast and share in the joy of, you know, our craziness. <laughs> um, so, yeah, what we're going to do now is get into today's show. Today, we're talking about Patricia. Joanne Wells Jennings. So I don't know. I mean, this is a pretty prominent case. Uh, so people who love who love true crime sort of should have heard of this before. But if you didn't, that's fine. I'm gonna bring this case to you, and let's just get started. Let's just go into this craziness. Um, and since it's just us. Go ahead and message me in the in the comments below. Let me know. Answer the questions that I'm giving you. Tell me what you think about it. Tell me if you think it, you know, she's crazy, not crazy. Would you deal with this? Would you not? Let me know. So this story is going to be weird because I normally like bringing you the story um, about the person behind the crime. But for this particular person, I couldn't find very much. So as I said tonight, we're talking about Patricia Joanne Wells Jennings. And as I stated, I couldn't find anything about Patricia's earlier life, except that she was born on October 24th, 1942. It doesn't seem like she was um, abused or anything or even had anything bad happen to her because usually you'll be able to easily find that. But being that I wasn't able to find that, then I'm guessing this didn't happen. Now, this is just me guessing because I wasn't able to find it. Um, but yeah, I didn't find anything about that. Uh, I didn't find anything about any criminal convictions. So didn't look like she ever got in trouble with the law before. And she was actually described, uh, to be a peaceful person by the people in her community. So that's as much as I know about her earlier life. Uh, she's, she was a nurse. 
So, you know, usually people in a medical profession are known to be caring people. Look, I'm not going to say 100% of the time because I know there are some buttholes out there, but I'm going to say usually people in the medical profession, which is why most times people get into the medical profession, you know, they're usually known to be loving and caring people. So Patricia and William Jennings first met on June 1983, and William Jennings was actually born in 1910. So he was substantially older than Patricia. So like we said, she was born in 1942. He was born in 1910. So he was, you know, older than her. And um, they met on June 1983 when Bill was called to Westwood Manor Nursing Home in Wilson, North Carolina. Um, Since he was an active member of the Alcoholics Anonymous, they used his experience as a consultant in that atmosphere for their patients in the nursing home. So Bill was actually described as a very good man who put together mental health programs in two different counties. Um, Like I said, counseled for AA and was on the board of directors for Flynn Home. Bill was also described as being intelligent, dedicated, loving, and a kind man who helped everyone. Now, these descriptions came from both Patricia and others in the community. So in February 1987, after four years of dating, Patricia and Bill ended up tying a knot. They got married. At this point in time, Bill was 77 and Patricia was 44. So like I said, much older. In September of that same year, Bill ended up bringing Patricia to see his financial consultant, whose name was George Henry, which is weird because you know that story about George Henry swinging the hammer and stuff like that? Anyways, that's a whole different thing. (laughs) But anyway, his name was George Henry. They went ahead and opened an account in Patricia's name, and then Bill placed half of his total assets into this new account. Um, And George, you know... Kind of, you know, obviously he was there to see everything that was happening. And he thought about, he recounted like how Patricia told Bill to transfer assets into her account. So George was saying like to him, it was a chilling scene. So this is a quote from George, quote, I can't remember the words so much as it was the way the words were delivered. And she was talking to him as if like he was not even a human being. Her face, her eyes, her tone was something like I had never seen before in my life. Bill's face turned bright white. I was shocked. It wasn't vulgar. There was no loudness. I mean, it was the just absolutely no compassion whatsoever for her husband. End quote. So over the course of the month after Bill opened Patricia's account, uh, two, uh, twenty thousand dollars worth was withdrawn from Bill's account through checks for one thousand and two thousand written out to Patricia. Then a month later, an additional seventeen thousand dollars was withdrawn from Bill's account to purchase a car from Patricia. And there were also more charges, like you know, credit card payments for motels and stuff like that. But then my question is, you already had $20,000 in your car, in your account. Why couldn't you have just bought a car for yourself? Like, why did he need to, like, take out another $17,000 to help you buy a car? But whatever. So within two months after they were married, Bill told George that Patricia had actually ended up leaving him with no money at one point in time. And she left him in a hotel. So he's in a hotel room. She took all his money and she left. And when that happened, you know, he was like, you know, George, I kind of want you to stop these money transfers to Patricia's account. So George was like, all right, I understand. That's a crazy predicament to be put in. Um, I would definitely want to stop this, this money transfer if it was me. So yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to do this for you. But then a short while later, the Jennings had made up. So Bill and Patricia made up. And then Bill gave Patricia power of attorney over his assets. However, two weeks after that, he ended up rescinding that power of attorney because what he said is he saw that Patricia was just like bleeding him dry. 
which I know this is going to sound mean, but to me, you should have seen that in the beginning, but mm, I can't speak. So now I was telling you how much money was coming out and everything. So let me, let me put this in perspective for you. One year after they got married, Bill's account had gone from $170,000 to only $37,000 in one year. So, I mean, doesn't Patricia and people like Patricia know that money is finite? Like at some point it's going to run out. And then what's your plan from there? Like you're going to go find somebody else and it's just going to be an ongoing, you know, if it's, if you're getting people based on looks, looks fade. If you're getting people based on, I, I don't know what else it could be, but it's like your plan for life is just to keep going from person to person after the money runs out. So tell me, you know, tell me in the comments below, what do you think? People like Patricia, do they realize that money is finite and if they do, they realize that, hey, even though this guy is rich, I could bleed him dry. What do you think their game plan is after that? Like, I just want to know. So speaking of money running out, by September 1989, and with their money running very low, let me not say with their, with his money but running very low, um, Bill then started to suspect Patricia of foul play. Now, my question is, why did it take that long? But, you know, just, just like what I was talking about before, love makes people do crazy things. Like, they put on these blinders and they don't see the person for who they are or they don't see, like, what other people are seeing. So, maybe, maybe that's it. I'm not sure. So, I just want to know, Ellen Emmers, what would you do in a situation like that? Like you use the person for their money and then they started coming to their senses. What would you do? Or even, 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 okay. Even if the shoe was on the other foot, you're the one giving the money, but you're coming to your senses. Like you're coming out of the fog. You're coming out of the haze. And you realize that the one you love is just with you for money. Do you think you'll have the strength to leave? Like, be honest. Like, don't even be like, hell yeah, I'm going to leave this and this. Be honest. Do you think you'd have the strength to leave? Because you're in, remember, you're in love with this person. You just found out that they're using you for the money. Do you think you'd have the strength to leave? Let me know. So Patricia's answer to what would you do is completely different from what the general consensus of these answers would be to do. So <clears throat> let's get into that. So Patricia reported that Bill had mental problems. He had depression and he had spells of dementia. She said that during his de depressive spells, he would start acting like a dog. Like whenever he got like really, really depressed, he would start acting like a dog. And she says that he would spend the day like walking like a dog. So like walking on all fours, he would be barking, he would be eating off the floor and so she ended up calling this his canine behavior. Now, during the course of their marriage, Patricia claimed that Bill would harm himself. Like, um, the story she gave that Bill had beat his testicles with a shoe, and then she said he'd later fallen in the bathtub. She said he would, uh, he would beat his naked body repeatedly, like, against the bathtub. So, like, he would be hitting himself against the bathtub and that he would also like pull his penis through the zipper of his pants and he would use a pair of pliers to do that so he'd have pliers clamp the penis closed and then just pull it through the zipper zippers of his pants and he would also punch on his testicles with a heavy steel toed shoe and this is just this is just like the harmful behavior that he was self-inflicted that's according to her. However, there's actually no documented cases of any of these stories. So it's just like complete hearsay. So this is what she said. There's no documented cases. Nobody else witnessed this. So now there are stories from loads of witnesses, you know, who have different things to say themselves. But we'll get into that in a minute. So moving on. 
On the night of September 19th, 1980,